I thought it would make sense for us to start with a snapshot as to where we are in South Africa as at this month. And uh, the stats are very interesting, you know, looking at TOGAF certification worldwide. South Africa currently ranks number 10 globally with 3,085 TOGAF certified people. And obviously that's not people that have gone through TOGAF training and uh, attended forums, etc. These are people who are actually TOGAF certified. You know, it's also very satisfying to, to see the growth and the adoption of the TOGAF standard over the years. You know, Looking six years ago, you know, 47,000 odd, you know, to one year ago, 102,000, and in 2021, 112,000. I mean, that is significant. And I'm really proud to see how South Africa ranks in the top 10, you know, given the fact that if you compare our GDP or our gross domestic product to other countries, well, we gads, we are certainly boxing above our weight. So how did we get there? I've split the agenda across these four stages. The early 1990s to 2000s, really what was the focus there was priming the pump. You know, 2000, you're taking off. 2010, the phosphate years, and probably here I need to explain what I mean by phosphate. It's an Afrikaans word, which means determination. It means hanging in. It means resilience. It means perseverance. And uh, we certainly went through an interesting stage then. And then really looking forward, being a, an optimist by nature, I really wanted to focus on where we can make the biggest difference. In other words, what is important to Africa as a continent and where the open group can really take things forward. So, priming the pump. And what I've done is I've drawn a timeline against what we were doing in South African breweries and how the TOGAF standard was developing over, over the years. Back in the day when we were the information resource management team in South African breweries, we had a significant focus on data warehousing. Our tooling was Bachman, and we focused on reverse engineering data structures and forward engineering, uh, um, you know, SQL databases. I first got to hear about the Zachman framework when I bought a magazine uh, from our central news agency, CNA, in, in, as it was called back in the day, titled uh, um, The ISA Lightning Bolt in the magazine Database Programming Design. And the article was written by Barbara von Hull. And to me, that was an absolute eye-opener, understanding how the, the Don Zachman framework can make such a substantial difference to how organizations can manage complexity and change. And the focus in that particular article was really around the data column, in other words, the what, um, you know, because of the focus on, on data warehousing at the time. We changed our tool set from Bachman to Aris, given the fact that we wanted to shift focus from data warehousing into uh, implementing ERP systems. And we had a choice between, between two systems primarily, and we settled on, on Aris. We had done a lot of work in that particular area, and uh, this work culminated into a number of slides, which are then presented at the Ziffer con conference in Scottsdale, um, Arizona. And I've summarized a bunch of the slides onto a, onto a quick collage, and I think you might recognize some of these particular pictures. So going back way in the beginning, you might, that statement, you know, enterprise architecture is required to transform a fragmented legacy of applications and processes, both manual and automated, into an integrated environment that is responsive to change and the delivery of the business strategy. Well, you know, that kind of went through a couple of changes and then ended up as the purpose statement that went into TOGAF version 8 and has been carried across into, into the nine versions. And really it was around driving that fusion between business and, and technology, you know, where the enterprise architecture process was the linchpin between the two. We then, behind that, we also had you know, the Zachman framework where I'd taken the NIST model, the NIST model, which had a small little pimple on the top of it you know, as a pyramid, which was business. And I turned that or inverted it you know, where the focus was in business, and there we created you know, the foundation of the cube. Again, behind the scenes, having a direct mapping against the Zachman framework. We used a meta model in order to manage uh, uh, the complexity of how we structured the models and how we configured the EA tooling, specifically ARIS. And we also drove the, the multiple layers, and you'll see some alignment back to where we are with TOGAP at the moment, you know, where you have a meta model in the form of an IRM framework or a meta meta model. And then you know, how it's segmented, in other words, you know, the enterprise, uh, the business framework as a segment, and then the, the product framework, as we currently refer to in TOGAP at the moment, as a capability framework. 
then using the Zachman framework to to con to manage the, the the content across those different frameworks. Bruno spent a lot of time supporting the tooling where we had a direct mapping between the Zachman framework and the and our, our catalogs, matrices, and diagrams that we used within our EA, EA repository. And a key aspect was the word, the model is the documentation. So that we reduced the cost of documenting stuff in MS Word and the creation of training material because we could then generate documentation directly out of the MS repository. At the time, that was a major breakthrough. So much so, in fact, that we had visitors from all over the world to, to come see what we had done and uh, you know, take the learning forward. So the approach was recognized as industry leading and, and being highly innovative and actually changed quite a lot. You know, to me, one of the key aspects of enterprise architecture is around knowledge management, you know, where we're converting personal tacit knowledge into organizational knowledge and putting those who know and those who need to know to, um, together. And obviously we do that through modeling. And you know, by applying the IRM concept specifically around the IRM framework, the Zachman uh, constructs of primitives and composite models, we could then mass customize the content to meet a specific stakeholder's need. And uh, that's exactly what we did do. So the model became the documentation and we were managing intellectual capital as a resource within, within the organization. Um, and across differing, differing frameworks, you know, at an enterprise level, a segment level, and what we called a product level. Um, and uh, it, it really made a significant difference. We reduced our cost of the development of training material by a significant uh, number to the point that we could literally pay for our enterprise architecture initiative simply out of the saving by generating training material. While priming the pump, what we did is we exposed a number of South African organizations to the work that we had done. In fact, it was almost like an airport lounge, getting back to my airplane analogy, in that we had visitors from, as I said, all over the world, but we focused specifically on the local market. So we had organizations, you know, Sassel, Eskom, and a number of others, including some of the, the larger consulting organizations like PwC and Deloitte, etc. Through my work in IT strategy development, I was invited to participate in the development of the COVID third edition. So we had access to that content before it was published. And I think you know, that was a major advantage and that's really the type of value that the Open Group adds as well. You know, the ability to influence the direction of standards as well as having advanced sight of emerging standards. And that, that content, you know, the COVID th uh, third edition, then served as a direct input into the development of the SAB uh, Global IT Strategy. And this project was sponsored by Graham Mackay, who at the time was the CEO of uh, South African Brewery's PLC, SAB PLC. And what made this particular assignment so different was the time that it was spent on focusing on the business architecture. I'd been involved in a number of IT strategy projects and it was so frustrating because of the fact that there was a disconnect between what the business wanted and what IT had to deliver. It was no way close to driving fusion between business and technology, so alignment was the key objective. And what this brought out as an assignment, given PwC's input and given the fact that we had a lot of content within our enterprise architecture repository at the time that we could reuse, is a focus on things which have emerged in TOGAF 9, uh, you know, the focus on business architecture as a specific area. So in other words, we had the business model defined, you know, something which had been signed off by the board. We had um, a focus on business capabilities. We had a, a focus on, on value streams and, and things like that. And we then you know, tackled the IT architecture, you know, looking at the other BIDAP domains, basically. So business, information, dot applications and, and, and technology, and then came up with a, with, a, with a roadmap. So this was a significant, significant project. And enterprise architecture, certainly as a discipline, contributed to, to its development. And I think the key point was that given the past approaches of creating PowerPoint slides, we then moved from a static approach to developing strategy into something that was living and dynamic, fed through the contents of the enterprise architecture capability, specifically at the enterprise level or at the, uh, at the segment level. And that work we then turned into the cube. So the cube had the architectural domains. Again, it's taking it from the NIST or the NIST model, which had the small little pimple on the top being business into this particular view. So we had the domains, business information, data applications and technology, 
and then the various slices, you know, where it was going from the reference architecture, which is very analogous to the enterprise architecture continuum concept, going from group into business and then down into a product or application and also a project focus. So that we really saw that as, as knowledge, knowledge frameworks, you know, the ability to manage intellectual capital as a resource within, within the organization. And then in the establishment of the enterprise architecture practice, we focused on running it like a business. In other words, where there's a very clear understanding of who is the stakeholder or you know, the customer. What adds value? What are their concerns? You know, how do you package that intellectual capital to meet their particular uh, um, um, requirements? So that cube was then taken, taken forward uh, after we primed the pump, as it were, into our future stages. So in summary, we were running a parallel universe between what we were doing in South African breweries and what was happening with the Open Group. Moving from a requirement, looking at the proof of need, going to a proof of concept, looking at the proof of application, the relevance, you know, driving it towards a customer requirement, looking at a continuum, in other words, how do you manage the various frameworks, moving from um, generic to organization specific. And then uh, you know, moving into the strategy focus and putting you know, that governance together with, with, with strategy. So priming the pump, the uh, airplane is on the taxiway, about to take off. In 2001, we started Real RM with the princely sum of 400 rands worth of share capital. I was invited to present a, a paper at one of the IRM UK uh, um, sessions, and that's where I first bumped into the Open Group, where the Open Group had an ex exhibition stand and we got talking and uh, headed off, and then uh, we, we subsequently established a, a, a regional chapter as the first step. We were also, you know, at that time, we were getting involved in the development of, of TOGAF, you know, specifically around 8.1.1. 8 in 2004, you know, the focus was around getting things moving. At that particular point in time, there were only 94 members of the architecture forum and there were only four South African members. So it was really, really just uh, you know, down the runway about to take off. Uh, in 2004, we started the Enterprise Architecture Forum. And uh, this is where Carla Bell got actively involved and she, she was really a, a master in bringing the marketing and the positioning of, of our, our forums um, where it added significant value supporting the taking off of the Open Group within South Africa. We had established an Enterprise Architecture Forum way back in 2004, and uh, I typically introduce it as the mostly monthly Enterprise Architecture Forum, you know, where we get presenters and uh, who've got case studies or you know, specific learnings you know, coming out of the Enterprise Architecture discipline, where they'd present, and uh, mostly monthly because it didn't happen every month, uh, you know, given school holidays and things like that. And unfortunately, with the, with the COVID crisis or the COVID lockdowns, We've been very quiet for a, for a period of time. So all of those presentations are, are stored on the opengroup.co's site. And there's also a photo gallery, which is well worth visiting, you know, seeing how we looked way back when we were youngsters. And uh, there's some significant content that is very useful you know, way back from those days, which is still as, still as relevant today as it was then. We kicked off a number of architecture practitioner conferences in South Africa over a couple of years, the first being in 2006. And uh, the forums were done very professionally and I was extremely proud of the way the entire company and the entire Open Group South Africa came together. <laughs> the, the month of a particular EAPC was such a focus within the entire organization. It was really the only show in town and we put in an enormous amount of resource from a real RM perspective into getting these open group enterprise architecture practitioner conferences to be world class. And uh, I'm very proud of what was accomplished by the company Real RM and the Open Group South Africa and the Open Group globally in bringing this off. It was really a, a unique event with, on the South African calendar and added a lot of, lot of value. So we held a, a number of conferences over the years from 2006 to 2009 so yeah, the focus of the 2006 conference was how to introduce the Open Group to South Africa. More than 50% of the presenters were international speakers and international people. And again, we had significant support from the Open Group globally into South Africa to get this event to fly. At, at that particular point in time, you'll note that it's an IT architecture practitioners conference. We had not yet moved to calling it the Enterprise Architecture Practitioners Practitioners Conference. 
that kind of changed over over the years and uh, on the Sunday um, Mike Lambert because of the fact that we had no South African who had the right ticks behind his name from an open group certification perspective presented the, you know the TOGAF framework and focused specifically on TOGAF's architecture development method etc um, to the audience and that was the first time that a lot of South Africans were introduced to not only the open group, but TOGAF as a, as, as a method. The centerfold of the event program was the TOGAF ADM, which we lovingly refer to as the TOGAF COP circle. And uh, delegates were encouraged you know, when they attended events to refer to it and uh, you know, really you know, understand where the presentations fitted in and what had been, been done, etc. So it was really you know, just getting things moving from the start. So moving on to the 2000, at the 2007 conference, I was quite concerned because of the fact that we'd got things moving, but I was very concerned that the EA practice establishment was not really sustainable. In other words, the focus was on modeling. And uh, some of the fundamental practices or disciplines which needed to be in place, in other words, things such as the meta model and the ability to, to manage the content as a resource, uh, weren't as strong as they, as they should have been. And you'll see that the, the number of members had increased significantly and things were really flying. So in order to address the concerns, in other words, what makes an enterprise architecture practice or capability business appropriate and sustainable, our centerfold then moved to a systems thinking diagram that focused on how do you establish a business appropriate and sustainable enterprise architecture capability using systems thinking and you know, causal loop diagrams, feedback loop, etc. And uh, it was quite well received as a, as a deliverable. Again, challenges are you know, the how-to statements and you know, at the core, you know, what you need to do in order to have a business appropriate and sustainable enterprise architecture capability. And to me, it's the ability to package model content or repository content and package the services to provide content or deliverables that satisfies the stakeholders concern and through that you know, drive the virtuous feedback loops where the willingness to invest in that EA capability grows and then also on the outside having the, the loops about you know, manage the, managing the, the content of the repository as a resource, you know, trimming it, it's like gardening, you know, pruning, plumbing, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, etc. By the 2009 conference, things were really taking off. Alan Brown met John Zachman, uh, which you know, resulted in, in some interaction going forward into the future. Jim Hatella from the Security Forum you know, attended. In fact, that was the first time I, I met him face to face. Paul van Amarva was then elected chair of the, uh, the Open Group Architecture Forum, which was a significant achievement. So things were really humming. And you also see you know, Roy Irvine and a number of other, other faces on this particular uh, uh, um, conference. Another key aspect was that you know, TOGAF had been adopted by the South African government in the form of the GOEF, GOEF framework and uh, I'll be talking about that in more detail as I get further into the presentation. It was a significant step forward, the adoption of TOGAF into a government-wide enterprise architecture framework which was uh, the standard and that was also you know, a similar standard was adopted into other African countries such as Botswana. You know, so things were really flying. So with Paul as the um, elected chair of the Architecture Forum, we also had a significant focus on um, the development of TOGAF 9. I think one of the key points was the participation of the members. You know, we got together, we had workshops, we had discussion sections, and etc. From a, from a regional South African perspective, the involvement and commitment of the members was really, really fantastic. And that uh, added a lot of value to, I think, you know, the quality and the, the delivery of, of version 9 of TOGAF. So here you know, we had the reviews where we logged over you know, 100 change suggestions. The members you know, such as Sassel, Let's Say My Real RM, University of Pretoria and others were, were actively involved. And uh, you know, this was one of the events which uh, you know, we celebrated, you know, the release of Togo Togo F9, which was uh, a really something which we can all be proud of, you know, given the South African contribution in taking Togo forward into, into its next release. So focusing specifically on the government-wide enterprise architecture framework, the presentations which uh, I found particularly useful was the Goya framework itself, in other words, how it was put together, uh, how it was adopted within, within South Africa, and uh, you know, integration. So there were a number of, of presentations around, around the Goya, Goya, Goya framework. Um, and again, you know, the challenges that were faced you know, and uh, how it was brought to life and, and how it was, was given and how it was adopted within, within South Africa. 
you know, the life cycle as to how the Goya framework uh, evolved is particularly interesting as well. Into Goya version 1, the Zachman framework was the, you know, the key input. And then into Goya version 1.2, the TOGAF uh, 8.1.1 was, was introduced. And then into Goya 1.2, which was released in 2009, uh, the TOGAF 9 uh, um, standard was, was, was used. So it's and a number of papers were, were pu published ar around it. You know, so the, you know, the governed wide the actual framework itself, you know, plus guides as to how to implement it within within gov government organisations. So it's applicable to to all levels within government. You know, whether it's national, provincial, or local, you know, as well as the, you know, the work that was done within the enterprise architecture space. So it's kind of analogous to the the USA Klinger Cohen Act, and that becomes more and more clear you know, as we moved into uh, the use of governance frameworks and uh, how it was taken forward you know, over a couple of years. Summarizing, we'd gone through really exciting times, establishing real RM, getting the EA forums going, getting the EAPC or the Enterprise Architecture Practitioners going, the mapping, uh, the, the establishment of the M forum I'm going to come back to in, uh, further into the presentation, and uh, you know, Paul being selected you know, as, the, as the chair of the architecture forum, which made us all you know, very proud and supportive, and how South Africa adopted and embraced TOGAF, not only within the corporate world, but also into, into, into government. And again, you know, we have this direct alignment between what was happening in the Open Group South Africa and the Open Group globally, you know, specifically around the development of TOGAF as a method. So now we're moving into the 2010s, which I call the phosphate years. That was a very trying time for running any business in, in South Africa, and also globally you know, with the financial crisis. So there were a lot of you know, social, political, and economical um, factors, which made it difficult to keep the momentum that we had built up over the 2000s. We had a couple of architecture forums or EAPC conferences, um, you know, focused uh, on discipline, etc. You know, growing it, looking at the state of enterprise architecture globally. And uh, to take a different tack, not stepping through each program, um, I'm going to leave this to Alan Brown, who was staring at the program at that particular point in time, and said, "You know, I, you know, I wonder how some of this stuff in government has come about. You know, you know let's understand you know, you know, the flow." So, in other words, you know, I'm going to drop into a, into a bit of a different line, you know, specifically around the alignment between COVID and TOGAF and how it evolved and how it was pulled into the South African government. Yeah, you know, I think this is quite a significant contribution and I fulfill the role of liaison between the Open Group and uh, um, ISACA and the ITG, ITGI, or the IT Governance Institute. And uh, you know, Steve Nunn and I kind of did a lot of work around getting the, 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 the legal requirements in place in order to be able to um, use both the COBIT and the TOGIF material and collaborate around that. My portion was more around doing the actual work, the mapping, and Steve handled all of the legal work. And thank you, Steve, it was a, a significant contribution. Um, so you know, I did a, a mapping between you know, COBIT 4 and TOGIF 8.1, and this was way back in 2006, and it was published by both ISACA um, and the Open Group. And to be Quite frank, um, it was of little use to the enterprise architects because it was written from the code perspective looking at TOGAF. So it added a lot of value to the, to the IT, IT auditors. I was then later um, invited to participate in the COBIT-5 development workshops that took place in London and, and Washington. And, um, Again, you know, I think one of the key aspects was being able to have access to that intellectual capital before it was, was published. And the areas that I was involved with you know, focused on IT strategy, innovation, and obviously enterprise architecture, enterprise architecture being my, my core passion. And uh, I think one of the key aspects was the driving. In other words, where in the previous mapping between 8.1 and COVID version 4, it was fragmented. It was a massive pile of interfaces and linkages, etc. And the key breakthrough moving into COVID version 5 is that it was consolidated into a single area, which I'm highlighting over there, you know, AP03, Managed Enterprise Architecture. 
So the fragmentation of the linkages between enterprise architecture and the 34 processes at the time within Cobic version 4 had been, had been addressed. So coming out of this work, we now had a direct mapping, and a, a simple mapping, between COBIT and TOGAF. And I also introduced you know, the aspect of you know, running an EA practice like a business. So in other words, you know, the last we you know, provide enterprise architecture services was focused on you know, running the EA practice like a business, you know, understanding who the customer and the stakeholder is, and then providing you know, services into it. Um, so the mapping is, is available, and obviously you know, you know, the COVID-5 standard is, is available. So you know, the key accomplishment here is that we, uh, we had the linkage. You know, so we had enterprise architecture as the linchpin between corporate governance and IT governance, where the corporate governance would be the, the, you know, the kings, the sarbanes, oxalis, and the IT governance being, being the, the COVID standard. This was taken forward within South Africa with the release of a six-letter acronym which stands for CGICTPF, Corporate Governance of Information and Communication Technology Policy Framework, which then took the, the work that was done in COVID-5 and mandated it into law as a requirement in South Africa for government bodies. And, that's, and that was a significant achievement. So we now had the ability to pull it together. So the priority areas, one of the 12 key focus areas, is managed enterprise architecture. And the Auditor General reviews government departments at a provincial, national and local level you know, using you know, these standards as, as the key input. So you know, this is uh, an example of you know, how we in South Africa have contributed to making open standards work and getting them in, adopted within the country and, and into, the, into, into the broader um, African continent through other, other, other countries. Another significant achievement was the uh, introduction of M, which is the Exploration, Mining, Metals and Minerals Forum. And that really built on a lot of work that was done you know, back in Anglo Platinum. You know, I spoke about Steve Rasmussen's presentations, you know, both in, you know, twice in Cape Town, also being inv invited across to the uh, Miami uh, um, conference. So really what we did is uh, Alvin Pauls, who was the CIO of Lonman at the time, uh, we attended a, a Gartner conference in um, Sun City. And uh, Alvin Pauls and I got onto the agenda and uh, you know, presented a, you know, a couple of options. You know, how do we realize value through the collaboration around a common operating model? You know, really putting your IT investments into areas of differentiation, other where the value is, versus you know, just being you know, something which is common across, across most, most organizations. Um, so at the Gartner conference in Sun City, Steve Rasmussen was, was also you know, an attendee, and uh, we did a lot of lobbying. You know, so the options that were, were you know, presented to the audience is, you know, go with a proprietary model, do your own thing, or as an alternative, work with the open group in order to create an open industry standard for the vertical. And uh, you know, given the lobbying and given Steve's support and, uh, and Alvin Pauls' uh, support, and uh, we actually managed to, to get that as an approach um, accepted, that the open group would establish a, a, a vertical. Um, and so the, the M Forum was, was officially established, I think, uh, in April uh, um, 2008, you know, where you know, Steve Nunn was directly involved and uh, we formalized the, the way forward. So South Africans have played key roles in M, um, you know, specifically, for example, Serena Fulyun, who was the forum director over a number of years, a direct contribution in pulling the, the reference models together. But then Roy Irvine, uh, he's standing in the middle of uh, Johan Skuman and, and Steve Rasmussen. You know, Roy really took it forward. You're looking at specifically at things like application portfolio management and linking that to the M model. So the M forum worked across the globe. You know, we had a number of members that were based in Australia and it was a global initiative. One of the key inputs in putting the standard together was some work that Adrian Forster had done way back in, in 2000 or 2001, uh, where he looked at the, the value chain you know, within uh, the mining industry. And that served as a key input. You know, Adrian also did a lot of work in that particular paper, you know, linking uh, his approach back to the Zachman framework. So again, you know, we have that enterprise architecture thread. I think that's one of the key things that we did do differently within the development of M is that we applied the open group standard, you know, the ADM, you know, the, the rigors around creating meta models and understanding you know, how 
the, the, the content framework would be constructed in the development of the actual standard itself. And the two key pu uh, publications were the, uh, um, the, the process reference model and the capability map. So here is the Exploration Mining Metals and Minerals process reference model. Um, you can see the, you know, the key members that participated at the, at the bottom. And really what it did is you know, summarized you know, the entire, uh, um, you know, from exploration to rehabilitation in a, in a single A4. The M team was recognized internationally. For example, through Gartner, one of their research papers recognized the contribution that the M forum had made and specifically the fact that it was through the open group where that contribution was then made into the broader public. The M team you know, presented at numerous forums. We had breakfasts, we had presentations in Sydney, we had presentations in Canada, and uh, we really you know, pushed the M uh, um, uh, understanding and the M contribution globally. And, uh, and thanks to the open group for, for facilitating that, I think we've made a difference. So now, moving into the 2020s, looking forward to Africa, we've gone through tough times in 2010. So you know, the key aspect you know, of looking forward into Africa is how do we play to our strengths? People, our natural resources, and the potential that technology can bring in order to grow Africa as a continent. And the Open Group will play a pivotal role in taking that forward. So that is our focus moving forward from the Open Group South Africa, moving into the Open Group Africa as our strategy. And focusing on people, it's this type of view where you have a class of students. This is taken from the University of, of, of Pretoria. And you'll notice two posters in the background. You know, that is the M capability map, and the one next to it is the M process model. Really what we see is that the deliverables and the products coming out of the open group and the collaboration around the various forums can be injected into the youth and taken forward as part of their career development going forward into the future. So in other words, you know, the whole focus is far more agile. You know, the open group is now producing deliverables and work far faster than I have ever seen in the past. You know, the way the organization has been structured, the having specific people focusing on product management, like, like Sonia. The new forums which are being, being created, you know, like the Open Footprint, um, there is a significant opportunity you know, to focus on the M forum as an industry vertical, where we have the horizontal forums being the architecture forum, in other words, applying the architecture disciplines for creating content specific to the M forum. Other cross-cutting forums, such as the security forum, where we basically apply the discipline of enterprise architecture to build and structure the content in the architecture continuum and the solutions continuum. So really what we're proposing is that we apply the discipline of enterprise architecture to create the products and services that are within the industry vertical supported and collaborating with the horizontal you know, security forum, um, the OPAF forum specifically, which I'm going to get into now. And I think the OPAF forum, or the Open Platform Automation Forum, is one of the more exciting aspects that can now add significant value into how we put it together. In other words, crossing the divide between what happens in industrial IT versus what's conventionally happened within the enterprise architecture space where we, 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 we can now span both industrial IT as well as the conventional business systems approach as we've done in the past um, in, in, in Togo primarily. So in other words, the focus is you know, addressing both the architecture continuum and the solutions continuum where we are focusing on industry architectures and industry so solutions that are specific to the Exploration, Mining, Metals and Minerals Forum. And we've done a lot of work in that, that in the past. Anthony Ducci and Johannes Skumann and later uh, uh, Roy Irvine and Adam uh, um, worked on application portfolio management where they mapped mining solutions back against the M capability map and, and reference model. That is the type of work that can add significant value to the members of the Architecture Forum the members of M because of the, the synergistic collaboration across forums. This is the way to drive up value and reduce costs, allowing organizations to focus on what 
provides competitive differentiation or advantage. The M vision was from the boardroom to the rock face. By applying this technique and looking at the cross-forum collaboration, you know, specifically, for example, within the OPA forum, I think this is realizable. And I, I look forward to working with the, the industry and, again, you know, from the mining side and into the solution space to address this particular uh, um, vision. Within the Open Platform Automation Forum's um, documentation, one of the papers has a business scenario that looks specifically at mining. And you know, that will serve as a key starting point for understanding, well, shoot, what can the mining community and what is of value to them in the context of the OPAS standard? So you know, a starting point would be to unpack that and to expand on it. You know, that becomes a very clear you know, statement of need or a requirement from the members of the M forum into the OPAS and the OPAF into the OPAS standard and into the OPAF, uh, OPAF forum. You know, other examples would be, you know, for example, a lot of the a lot of the modeling work has been done. The Archimate standard has evolved significantly over the years. You know, now at 3.1 it is really reaching a point of maturity. So one of the things we would do is to take a lot of the content that's been produced in the past and you know, remodel it complying with the, with the Archimate um, standard. Um, so there is a lot to do. You know, if you look at the TOGAF 9.2 artifacts, in other words, the catalogs, matrices, and diagrams, which are created across the differing BIDAT domains, we notice we've only really addressed two, you know, basically being the process model and the capability map. So there are still a lot of artifacts catalogs, matrices, and diagrams that could be then created within the industry focus, both uh, from a solution and an enterprise perspective that could uh, be made available to, to members, uh, especially if we uh, adopt open modeling standards, you know, such as, such as uh, Archimate. So looking forward to Africa, the exact same concept, in other words, we are, where we have an industry vertical and that we drive the synergies between the horizontal focuses, architecture, etc. Um, into driving value within the industry vertical, the vertical um, view, applies to government as well. So there is a government EA work group that is led by Dr. Saha. He's the general manager of India for the Open Group. I've attended a number of the calls. There's been presentations, from example, out of Kenya. There's also been presentations coming out of the European Union where the work being done in those countries is awesome. And there's a real opportunity for the African members of the Open Group to get actively involved. Um, and I think this is where we can really make a difference. You know, I fear that we're being left behind because of the fact that we're not engaging, we're not participating, we're not extracting the value that we could through either not knowing about it or not being engaged. And this is something we can do about it. And you know, these are the type of topics which uh, are, are addressed within it. For example, in South Africa, there are certain departments who are using Archi as a free and open source tool, and they are complying with the Archimate meta model in order to create content in a structured manner. And if you compare that as a leading example versus a number of other Goya assignments where it's done in PowerPoint and Word and Excel spreadsheets, etc., where the intellectual capital is hardly reusable, and uh, I think we might be con confusing activity with, with progress. And this, again, you know, by collaborating and participating in the open group, engaging with the, with the work groups and forums, we can start sharing content you know, across government departments, not only within South Africa, but also globally. And I, I really hope that you know, this comes to fruition because it can really make a significant contribution to how we lead forward into Africa, combining our resources, combining our people, our talent, and combining technology in order to make a significant difference to our lives in Africa. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.